going to today talk about the uh, Kelvin Voigt model. So we've mastered the Maxwell model. So now we're looking at Kelvin Voigt, where we were basically uh, we had our dash bot here and our spring in parallel. So now, since we're in parallel, we know that the strains in our Kelvin Voigt model should be equal, uh, and our stresses, however, will have to kind of sum. So Rewriting that expression again, writing it in terms of kind of strain uh, rate here. So we know that uh, these are equal. So thus we know that this uh, expression here is also going to be uh, equivalent. So now we can rewrite uh, this equation and this expression right here. So we have our stress. We rewrite uh, this function, uh, rearrange, and we could get our expression for the strain rate of our Kelvoit model as a function of. Uh, basically these other variables. So if we want to, again, this is just kind of uh, setting up that expression. So remember, strains are equal, stress is sum. So we know that the stress in AV is this, S, S plus viscosity of our dash pot D, strain rate of our dash pot D, but we know this relationship so we could plug in. So we will then have that the strain rate of our Kelvin Voigt model will be equal to, uh, you just kind of rearrange and divide out there. So it'll be the stress in our KV divided by the dash plot, plus, or basically minus this uh, E, Young's modulus over that, divided by the dash plot again, times our, this is again equal to our strain in KV. So just rearranging, writing out that expression. Um, so for stress relaxation, again, what do we do here? Uh, we could, again, do that same uh, kind of idea. So for stress relaxation, what are we applying? Are we applying constant strain or are we applying constant stress? So for stress relaxation, we apply uh, basically that constant stress, or constant strain, excuse me, and we uh, apply, so here, strain is equal to epsilon naught. So you could find that this equation becomes zero equals so the kV, or just the stress over viscosity d minus e sub s over eta times basically r e naught. And now we could rearrange uh, this expression. So you divide out, so it becomes basically just stress is equal to e epsilon naught. That's it. We can just plot this uh, function here. So stress is a function of time, as predicted by our Kelvin Voigt model. Is just going to be uh, <laughs> essentially your this kind of constant value over here. Oops, it's just going to be this flat line. So that obviously does not capture uh, our behavior. Uh, just going to be epsilon naught, or just this e naught, basically sigma naught. <laughs> so. That's going to be a flat line. So again, does that match with what polymers really do? No, because we said again, they should decay, kind of this uh, exponential decay. So our Kelvin Voigt model fought, fails at stretch relaxation. So this is not good. It should not behave like that. But for creep, we get a little bit of a better uh, kind of uh, behavior that matches what we'd expect from polymeric materials. This expression right here. So let me, in this expression, if we plot this, so you see. Here, our time, we're going to see that at time t equals zero, we're going to have kind of nothing. Again, at t equals zero, our exponential is one, everything cancels out, but we're going to kind of asymptotically reach this, uh, again, this kind of elastic response here. So, again, at long times, you know, you know, what's happening here? Like, why does this behavior make sense? Actually, we're, you know, in terms of our model. Well, at long times, we said that the dash pot will basically behave as it's unconnected. So at very, very, very long times, we're just going to, you know, if we apply a constant stress, we're just, you know, that strain is just going to be this kind of elastic response here that we get. Let's pull up right over here. So at long times when our, uh, when that spring, when this dash pot is disconnected, we're going to re recover basically our Hooke's law, this. So our strain will be at a constant stress, we'll just be this flipped over. That's it. So asymptotically approaches. So for our, uh, basically for our creep, the Kelvin Voigt model behaves uh, very, very, very well. And you could build even more complex models to uh, kind of capture, again, 
more of these um, exotic viscoelastic properties of materials. So you could use the standard linear solid model or the Maxwell Zinner model. Um, and again, that, the, the key kind of idea here, and actually, but let's look at those real quickly. So this is your standard linear solid model. So again, you can see it's uh, basically a combination. So you have the Maxwell here and then the Kelvin Moit, Moit uh, kind of in parallel as well. So you could capture more exotic uh, viscoelastic behavior uh, and more detailed uh, behavior uh, materials or polymeric materials. And again, you could add, uh, you'll see some very, very, very complex models where it could be, you know, multiple, you know, springs and dash pots. And then it's connected to, you know, another Maxwell model here, or if there's just another kind of spring and that's in parallel with some other apparatus, you know, it, it can, it can get very, very, very uh, complex, very, very quickly. So these expressions are actually not easy to kind of develop. And actually when you get into these more exotic models, um, you're going to kind of make some assumptions that we kind of talked about previously. So at small times, high frequencies, dash pots are going to be just rigid links. So the dash pots just basically behave like a solid wire, uh, but at long times they're going to be completely disconnected. So you're, apparatus or this kind of parallel is going to just kind of fall apart. Uh, it's going to be completely disconnected for dash bots. Again, that's something that you could utilize in order to kind of obtain an expression or a functional form for how stress and strain are going to vary as a function of time in order to kind of get to this viscoelastic uh, response. Um, one of the other things you could do is use Boltzmann superposition principle uh, to determine stress. So you could uh, basically sum the strain uh, and uh, during multiple deformation steps. So you could define essentially this parameter that's called the uh, creep compliance. Uh, it's gonna relate uh, essentially strain to stress as a function of time. And you can do the same thing for stress relaxation too, except you'll have the relaxation modulus G, T. Um, and you can kind of look at this on the next uh, kind of slide. So the kind of idea is you observe experimentally or you get the solution for, okay, at one time you apply a constant stress, we see what the strain response is, and then we do the same thing for T1 and T2, and then again, a higher stress here, and you could just sum uh, basically all these superposition solutions. So you multiply again that stress times that again, creep compliance or your stress relaxation modulus. So creep compliance J sub T or your relaxation modulus G of T, and you can get to these kind of expressions. And again, start to get some intuition on how um, the material is going to behave. Now, do we do this? Uh, often from uh, polymer materials as real polymer engineers and polymer physicists. No, not really. Um, so the reason being is because we are going to introduce a much more robust uh, and a really, really cool kind of methodology experimentally in order to uh, deduce and get some intuition and see actually uh, some of the this and actually determine some key parameters, specifically the relaxation time. Uh, and also we're going to look at some kind of key transitions um, in terms of time, temperature, and also frequencies uh, and see how that material behaves and we'll see where we transition from an elastic solid to a viscous fluid. So more on that in the next video when we talk about dynamic mechanical testing. Thanks, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.